The first thing we're going to do this morning is I'm going to show you the kind of question where the complex conjugate root theorem um, sort of shines and just saves you a dramatic amount of time, and then we'll have a look at the ins and outs of it. And then we're going to look back again at multiplicity of roots. Okay, that'll be um, that'll all be this morning, and then in uh, period six, I think it is, um, we're going to carry on to identities. So here's the question we're looking at um, now. I kind of gave you a distinct advantage, good morning, by telling you right away that this question has to do with complex conjugate root theorem. Or rather, you can take advantage of complex conjugate root theorem right off the bat to save you a dramatic time. Okay? So how am I going to use it in the light of this polynomial and this root? Um, you, uh, you already have a complex root and they're all real coefficients. Fantastic. So you can take the conjugate and you multiply them together to get a squared without any Excellent. Okay, good, good. So just rewind a little bit. The two pieces of information I knew are, I know are, number one, all real coefficients, thumbs up. Number two, I have one of the roots and it's it's complex, right? Well, I mean all of the roots would be complex, okay? But importantly, it has an imaginary part. So therefore, I'm going to state by the complex conjugate root theorem, and I'm going to encourage you to write this even though it is pretty long. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't think CCRT is accepted the way DMT is. So I'm gonna say complex conjugate root theorem just because I don't want the conjugate to just come out of nowhere, right? So by this theorem, since, and this is way more detailed than probably need, but I'm trying to be mathematically sound as well as providing the right answer. Since P of Z has real coefficients, That means if I just take the conjugate of this, I've got another root. Okay. Now this is great for two reasons. Number one, thinking back to not the free trade agreement but the fundamental theorem of algebra, this is a polynomial of degree three, which means it has how many complex roots? Three. Exactly three, right? No fewer, no more. So I've already got two of them. I only need to find the last one. That'll be useful to me in a second. So now that I know these two, that tells me something about the factorization, right? So I can say, therefore, P of Z is equal to, I've got Z minus this, Z minus that, and then I'm going to have some quotient along the end. Okay? So I'm going to have, just watch out your brackets and signs here, I'm going to write it as Z minus this, Z minus this. So, so you yep. can't actually just solve 2 plus 3i into the equation. Oh, because it's a linear factor. I, I can, I can, but it won't give me anything useful. Yeah. All it will tell me is zero according to the factor theorem, right? Oh, like it will, it will just pop in and say, yep, it's right. That's, okay. that's all it will tell me. Okay. Um, so there's the first two factors that I already know. Now I don't know what the other factor is. I'm just going to call it Q partly because I already have P and Q for quotient, okay? Because having divided three by this factor. Now, have a look at this. What I want to try and get to is, well, what's the final factor? Because I want a linear factorization, like we said, degree three, I've got one, two, that's the third one, okay? Before I get there, um, you can see one of the great things about the fact that they're complex conjugates is that these guys are going to simplify out really, really easy, okay? Now, before you launch into doing three terms times three terms and ending up with nine terms at the end, which hopefully will simplify out, simplify out into your algebra, I want you to remember some of the properties of these complex conjugates, right? So maybe just off on the side here. This is a secondary note. If you have z minus alpha and z minus alpha bar, okay? Think about this for a second. Just think about how it's going to expand just as a command. Come in. That's right. Just think about how it's going to expand as a as a binomial. Okay, what are we going to get? You're going to get z squared out the front. Minus, minus alpha z two. Oh, alpha, no, I'm sorry, no, I'm thinking of first. You know, it's going to be alpha. Z. Uh, well, just think about it, you're going to put them together, right? So oh, if I say oh, alpha yeah. z, it's going to be also an alpha bar z, right? And then what's trailing along the end? It just comes from the constant term, right? Which is plus alpha alpha bar. Is that okay? But remember what alpha and alpha bar are and how they relate to each other, right? They are complex conjugates. So therefore, another color. When you add them together, when you add them together, the imaginary parts are going to disappear or they're going to cancel out, right? So in fact, all you're going to get is two lots of 
the real part of alpha. Do you agree with that? Right? The imaginary part will disappear. OK, what happens when we multiply them? Hmm. What happens when you multiply them? Right, look at them. Look at what's oh, going to happen. Difference it's difference of squares, but because of the i's that come in, it ends up being the sum of squares, right? So in fact, this part is going to become the real part of alpha squared and the imaginary part of alpha squared. OK, does that make sense? And that's going to dramatically make this simpler. Like every time we use the complex conjugate root theorem, we're going to get complex conjugates. So rather than multiply this whole thing out, it's a disaster. And it's, it, you're asking for silly errors to creep in. I'm just going to take advantage of these results. So for instance, I'm going to get a quadratic, as I know. right? And then I'm going to take away, now what's double the real part of my chosen alpha? Yeah, double the real part is just 4. That was a lot simpler than trying to deal with three terms that are going to be the z term, which would be a mess. Um, and then I'm going to add on, add on the real squared and the imaginary squared. That looks like four and nine to me. Okay. Yep, so that's thirteen. Whoa, just like that, right? This is why complex conjugates are so um, easy to work with. Okay. okay, does that look right? Yeah, it looks good to me. Okay, now at this point, there are one of two things that we can do. There are two paths to finish out the question and find out what this Q of Z is. Anyone want to suggest to me what one of the paths might be? You look at the constant term and say you need 3 to get 39. Okay, so the first, method, the first method is, and I need to actually rewind a little bit, right? The first method is to recognize, okay, this must be a linear factor, right? It must be linear because I've already got degree 2 here. This has to multiply to degree 3, so this must be degree 1. It's not only linear, I also know it's monic. How do I know it's monic? <laughs> this is monic, this is monic, that must be monic, okay? So it's got to be monic and linear, which means that I can write this in this form. Uh, Z minus, I already talked about alpha, so I'm just not going to call that bigger. Okay, yes? Yeah, very good. It would have, it would have, um, yes, that's right. So, in order to ha have, like, the issue you're coming up against is for complex conjugate root theorem, right? I know that either you're going to have complex conjugates or you're going to have complex coefficients up here. And I can't have either of those, right? Because I've already used two of my roots, I've only got one left, and I don't have any complex coefficients to get an extra thing out from. So, that's nice. I don't necessarily need to state that, but it's helpful to know. Okay? So, I guess I'm going to say here, um, but. Q Z must be monocolinear. Okay. Now that's P of Z. Um, now I'm actually going to write P of Z over here on the left, right? It's actually this. Now what Nikita was just mentioned is essentially comparison of coefficients, right? Essentially comparison of coefficients. We're trying to say that whatever this ends up being. It was our original polynomial, right? But if you look closely, for instance, you can see there's only a single z-cubed term. Right? There's only one way out of this expansion to get a z-cubed term. It's out of this z-square and that z. There's no other combination of these terms that will give you z-cubed. In exactly the same way, there's only one combination of terms that will give you this constant over here. Which combination is it? It's going to be it's plus, right? Uh, yeah. This plus 13 and this minus beta. Do you agree with that? So that's one way of saying it. Another way of saying it, which I kind of prefer because that's um, like I'd rather write it out. I can just evaluate t of 0. That's another way of getting to the constant term. That's taking away all of the z's, all the variables, right? If I evaluate p of 0 over here, this goes 0, 0, 0, minus 39. Do you agree with that? And then this guy becomes, uh, well, 0, 0, 13. <laughs> times 0 minus beta. Okay, like so. Okay. So there you go, you've got your value there, and you can bring that back in a second. 